So we start, yes. Uh, today my topic is hip and knee partners in crime. And uh, it's a very clinical topic, a topic of which I've had a lot of experience of treating knee patients over the years of my practice. And uh, today we are going to focus on a few things that we sometimes do not give so much attention to. So we're going to talk about knee dysfunction or pain that occurs without any obvious trauma. We're not talking of uh, patients uh, who are coming from the sports field or have had a fall. Uh, and our focus specifically today would be on the transverse or the rotational movement that occurs between the femur and tibia. As we know, that screw hope mechanism is a very important key element to knee stability. And in the open kinetic chain, tibia rotates externally during knee extension and internally during knee flexion. Whereas the, in the closed kinetic chain, the femur rotates internally during knee extension and externally during knee flexion. During the gait cycle, the normal range of rotation at the tibiofemoral joint is about 10 to 15 degrees. But when there is excessive rotation at this joint, it affects the stability and the biomechanics of the knee, leading to knee pain. According to Shirley Salmon, who is a pioneer in movement impairment syndromes all over the world, and she says that the most common cause of non-traumatic knee pain is excessive rotation between the femur and tibia and she calls it the tibiofemoral rotation syndrome. This could be with valgus or, or with or without valgus or varus. Now, what happens when there's excessive rotation between the tibia and femur? It leads to patellofemoral pain, ACL injuries, iliotibial band friction syndrome, and OAD. All these conditions we see very often in our practice. There's been a lot of research in this field and Salsis and Perman have reported that uncontrolled tibiofemoral rotation was the largest predictor of patellofemoral pain. But why does this excessive rotation occur between the femur and tibia? Let's find out. One of the most important reasons is the motion impairment at the hip. And this is a research done by Christopher Powers, a pioneer in knee pain, and uh, whom I've had the opportunity to uh, trained with at the University of Southern California, he says that uh, movement impairment, the hip may underlie injuries like ACL tear, iliotibial band syndrome, patellofemoral uh, joint pain, and OAE. Uh, this is a research done by uh, the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and they have done it on OAE, and they say that the hip strength muscles are very important reason for OAE, and when you strengthen these muscles, the pain decreases in patients with OAE. A research done by the Physical Therapy Department of Wichita University in, uh, in USA uh, talks about the interdependence between the hip and the knee joints in respect to functional activity and is a ne necessary and important uh, in aspect that we should investigate when we treat our knee patients. Uh, this is a research done by uh, a uh, University of Southern Stanford University, California, and uh, they have done it on distance runners and with ITBS syndrome. And they see, say that the weaker hip abduction muscle strength uh, is, uh, is affected with, in people with ITBS, whereas it's not so with unaffected uh, those who do not have ITBS. And when we improve the hip, hip abduction strength, the knee pain and the ITBS uh, or the lateral knee pain. ITBS is, uh, is responsible for lateral knee pain and that decreases. Hence, in today's presentation, we will find out how dysfunction of the muscles of the hip are responsible for excessive rotation at the tibiofemoral joint leading to knee pain. So when we prescribe exercises, we often prescribe these kind of exercises but we also should look at the excessive tibiofemoral rotation that is occurring in the transverse plane in these patients. Let's have a look at what is the ideal alignment of tibia. Uh, uh, as, uh, so uh, if you draw a line from the center of the ankle to the second metatarsal, that would we call it the tibial line. Ideally, the tibial line should be about 10 degrees lateral 
to the sagittal plane. And what's the ideal uh, alignment of femur? The center of the knee or the patella should be vertically above the tibial line. But sometimes we, uh, we do not have the patella in the perfect position. So it is also important to look at the hamstrings from the posterior aspect of the patient. And usually the medial and lateral hamstrings should look symmetrically when they stand like this. So the hamstring insertion is a good guideline for femoral rotation. In this uh, lady, you see they are pretty symmetrically at the posterior aspect of her thigh. But we all know that static posture is only the window into a movement and it is merely a starting point to assessing movements, which is very important for us physiotherapists. So uh, ideal alignment of uh, the fever and tibia uh, should be the center of the knee should be above, vertically above the tibial line. This is in the walking in stance phase. This alignment is important to check always the partial squat because this is the same position uh, where the leg is in the same alignment prior to just prior to the heel lift in a normal gait. So uh, let's look at the three common malalignments of the tibia and the femur. There could be excessive medial rotation of fever. That means the center of the knee is medial to the second metatarsal if you drop a plumb line. And again, viewed from the back, it would look something like this. You can hardly see the lateral insertion of the hamstrings, uh, especially in her right leg. And then we have the excessive lateral rotation of tibia, which we all see very often. And in this, the tibial line is more than 10 degrees lateral to the sagittal plane, as we see in this picture. Lateral rotation of tibia can also be detected in the, in the swing phase. Like you see in her, in her case, the right tibia is much more laterally rotated than the le left tibia. In this patient too, in the toe off, it seems to be pretty normal, but as soon as she is in the mid swing, you see the tibia is rotating laterally in an uncontrolled manner. Here too, you see the lateral rotation of her right tibia as she ascends and descends the stairs. Uh, very often the TFL and ITB are, are tight or stiff. And when we do the modified Thomas test, we get the uh, foot moves in the lateral direction because of the tibia. And this would be another test to check the lateral rotation of tibia, which is not possible when the hip and knee are flexed. The most common, however, we see in many, many, many of our patients and in many of us physiotherapists too, the excessive medial rotation of fever and a compensatory excessive lateral rotation of tibia, as you see in this young girl. Again, viewed from the back, you can see, especially her right leg, there's a lateral rotation of the tibia and there is a medial rotation of the femur from the hamstring insertions. Uh, the lateral hamstrings are barely visible. So let's look at 19-year-old Alka. Uh, she came to us with right knee pain for three months on walking, stair climbing and descent, sit to stand, squatting, and at night while she was asleep. She had already been doing some exercises suggested earlier to strengthen her quadriceps and hamstrings, to stretch her hamstrings and calf. She was doing active SLR, but there was not a significant reduction in her knee pain. Alka had no history of trauma. She had no virus or valgus. I've purposely taken a very simple case in a young girl. Uh, no knee hyperextension. Uh, the radiographs were pretty normal at the patellofemoral and tibiofemoral joint, and her test for ligament integrity was normal. On examination, she, there was no patella malalignment. She did not demonstrate any excessive foot pronation nor tibial rotation during single leg stance or gait assessment. Uh, we te tested a whole lot of muscles, but the muscles that are important for us to know in this uh, presentation was the gluteus maximus and medius strength was, th was three on 10 and a quadriceps was four on 10. The hamstring length was normal. So we needed to find out in a young girl like this, 
without any obvious stroma, without any other malalignment that we obviously noticed, like varus, valgus, excessive pronation of the foot. What was the reason what she, why she was getting the knee pain? And how could we uh, decrease her knee pain and make her more comfortable and prevent also recurrence? So let's look at some of the tests that we did on Alka. The first test we did in standing, the alignment and analysis, and we found the center of the right knee was medial to the second metatarsal or the tibial line. And then we went on to do the movement analysis and we found that on single leg stance, again, the right knee was medial to the second metatarsal indicating excessive uh, medial rotation of the femur. And in the stance phase, the center of the right knee again was medial uh, to the tibial line and the femur seemed to be collapsing into medial rotation on weight acceptance on gait. Same thing we notice about when she ascended the stairs and when she descended at the stairs. So uh, in all her movement analysis and uh, standing analysis, we found that she did have excessive medial rotation of femur and reproduction of her knee pain. What was important was that we actually passively, manually with our hands corrected the medial rotation of femur in all these functional activities, there was tremendous decrease of knee pain. So we had to find out this excessive medial rotation of femur, was it a structural problem of the hip, uh, like femoral antiversion? Uh, these patients walked with the femur medially rotated or was it an acquired problem? To find out whether it was a structural problem, we did the CRAIG test for antiversion retroversion and we found that the greater trochanter was most prominent or superficial uh, when her tibia was almost vertical. The other picture, if you see, there's a 40 degrees angle between the vertical plane and, the, uh, and her tibia. And that would, if, if that was there, then she would be uh, called an antiversion structural problem. But in her case, that was not. So up to 10 to 15 degrees of tibia rotating is, uh, and femur actually rotating medially to indicate the tibia is, uh, is normal but more than that would indicate an antiversion. Uh, so uh, Alka's Craig test was normal and we found out that it was not a structural problem, it was an acquired problem. So why was it an acquired problem? Were the internal rotators of the femur stiff and therefore the femur could not go easily into external rotation when she did her movements? Or were the muscles that control the internal rotation of femur? And that is, of course, the external rotators, were they weak or not? Let's find out. So we did the modified uh, Ober's test for her, and we found that the TF and ITB were not stiff. So the, uh, so the muscles that control on the lateral rotators of the hip, uh, as we know, are these. We all know these muscles are the ones that, uh, that help in the lateral rotation of the hip. So we did a test for the for, to find out uh, whether she could hold this position, which we took it passively into extension, lateral rotation and abduction, uh, keeping the spine and pelvis neutral, whether uh, she could hold this position and eccentrically take her leg down slowly. We found that Alka could neither hold the position of external rotation, extension and abduction, and her leg just collapsed and, uh, and uh, she could not control the eccentric return of her leg. Indicating that the ex Alka's excessive femoral rotation was not because of femoral antiversion, not because of stiff TFL ITB, but it was because of the muscles that control the medial rotation of the femur or the lateral rotators were weak. So to summarize Alka's knee pain, the site of her pain was the knee. But the cause of her knee pain was excessive and uncontrolled medial rotation of femur. And the reason for this was weak external rotators of the femur. So the prescription physiotherapy for Alka uh, was exercises for the weak external rotators of the hip. We did a McConnell taping. We, uh, education was equally important in correct alignment of the femur and tibia and all symptom producing activities correction of wrong sustained postures, 
and foot orthotics if needed. Uh, Alka did not have excessive pronation of the foot uh, during her movements, and therefore uh, we did not give her foot orthotics. orthotics. We all know that excessive foot pronation of the uh, excessive foot pronation causes excessive femoral medial rotation, which was not applicable in her case. So we did not give her foot orthotics. So we focused on the exercise program exclusively the importance of all the lateral rotators of the hip. This was one of the exercises we had to do, especially for her gluteus maximus, keeping her knee flexed so that the hamstrings were not active and her upper body resting, keeping her lumbar spine neutral. This was another exercise that we did, isometric strengthening of the gluteus with the hips in external rotation and abduction. Uh, hip external rotation in this position. Resisted hip external rotation with a low grade theraband. Remember, low grade theraband is important because we are uh, stimulating or activating the weak muscles. If we use a higher level band, she may be able to do the uh, exercise, but then the deep gluteus maximus and, uh, and the external rotators and the deep gluteus medius will not be correctly isolated. But we found that in spite of giving her these strengthening exercises, she was not able to automatically use these muscles in all her activities of daily living. And she was still getting pain when she moved around uh, her house and went out. So we realized that it was equally important to integrate exercises with correct al alignment in functional activities. So first, what we did was McConnell taping. Um, and uh, to prevent the internal rotation of femur and give her a proprioception of how her femur should uh, not rotate internally when she walks or moves around. So the intent of taping was to prevent the uh, medial rotation of femur at the tibiofemoral joint. And uh, this tape in the single leg stands walking immediately reduced her pain by almost 60%. And Jenny McConnell has told us that um, if, uh, if you tape a person correctly uh, because of the, and the pain decreases by at least 50%, then uh, instantly when she starts doing the activity, then your taping is perfect. So we were very happy that her pain had decreased by more than 50% immediately after the taping. But of course, we had to make it more uh, dynamic and active. So we also taught her to tighten her buttock muscles. This is the instruction we gave her at heel strike to control the medial rotation of femur during walking. So the moment she did a slight, she slightly pressed her heel into the floor, tighten her butt muscles as she walked, uh, as she did the heel strike, she, her pain decreased and she was very happy that she would actively control the pain. Similarly, we asked her to do these single leg stance uh, exercises with her gluteus maximus, medius, and external rotators tightened. And that also uh, decreased her knee pain and alignment of her leg. Uh, we also stimulated a hip lateral rotators and sit to stand by keeping this uh, brick between her so that the feet don't move and giving her this thera tube to externally rotate her, uh, slightly externally rotate her hip muscles as she uh, stood and sat. Uh, side step up exercise was another important exercise. Uh, we taught her maintaining the alignment of the lower limb. Uh, we made her do it in front of the mirror with these markers. We also taught her the lunge. We put her foot on a rotating disc and asked her to keep her knee aligned with the second metatarsal. And, and, and that helped her a lot in, uh, in controlling, not only activating her correct muscles, but also in controlling her knee pain. Similarly, on staircase, we again taught her the similar thing of activating her muscles so that she could control the uncontrolled rotation of the femur and her pain decreased when she did that. Uh, very often, as I said, we see a compensatory lateral rotation of of the tibia when there is an in internal rotation of the femur. In her case, that was not so, but just as a, as a prevention, we, uh, we all know that popliteus is a very important stabilizer 
uh, not a very large muscle, but a very important muscle. So we put her foot on the rotating disc, uh, kept her femur uh, steady or uh, stable, and asked her to do internal rotation exercises of her tibia to activate her popliteus. We also taught her exercises for balance and proprioception. There was another factor, however, which was contributing to Alka's knee pain, and that was the postures in which she used to not, not move. So her activities became much better, but her static postures or sustained postures were still giving her pain. So we changed that too. Uh, Meckel and Associates has said that 20 minutes in a sustained posture can induce creep in the soft tissue requiring longer than 40 minutes to full recovery. So Alska was asked to first of all sit less uh, so that her, uh, uh, her hip muscles, especially her gluteus maximus and medius do not get stretched all the time and also not to sit cross-legged. Many of us women have the habit of sitting cross-legged especially, and that actually attenuates the lateral rotators and the uh, gluteus maximus and medians. And in spite of doing exercises, they do not give us as good results if we stop them from stretching it in static positions. So it was equally important also to show her this lying down position, which was the upper one, which she usually did, Again, attenuating all her external rotators and her hip muscles. And whereas in this position with a bolster or a, a pillow placed under her knee, where her hip and knee were parallel to the floor, she felt much better at night and when she got up in the morning. At the end of three weeks, Alka had no knee pain in all her daily activities and all her static positions. But her goal was to start running and so she continued to come to us for another three weeks till she could run without any pain. So Alka was pain-free at the end of three weeks and at the end of another three weeks, Alka could start running and we were very happy with the outcome. We did not do any quadricep strengthening or any calf exercise in her case, only we focused on the hip muscles and that made a lot of difference. There could be other factors that contribute to tibiofemoral rotation syndrome in many other patients. The habit of sitting in children like this, with the uh, knees pointing inwards and the feet rotating outwards. If we see children sitting like this, we must prevent them. Sometimes it's a structural problem. If it's a structural problem, then we have to treat it differently. But if it's an acquired problem, we have to uh, uh, treat the correct muscles as we talked about earlier. Uh, there are activities which require lateral rotation of tibia that could lead in future to tibiofemoral rotation syndrome. Activities like ballet dancing. Now, if you see her alignment of the uh, tibia, it is much more laterally rotated compared to her. Um, so I am treating uh, quite a few ballet dancers who later on in their life, by the time they become 20, 30 plus, or even 40 plus, they start getting the knee problems. Playing soccer, again, externally rotating tibia several times in, during the game can actually cause a problem. Horse riding, again, with the, with the foot in the stirrup and the knee pressed against the saddle causes a continuous external rotation at the tibia. Skating, same thing. Breaststroke, uh, with the uh, tibia external rotation, can cause tibiofemoral rotation uh, pain in the knee because of tibio, excessive tibiofemoral rotation. So to conclude in this presentation, our focus on how dysfunction of the hip muscles can cause knee pain and how excessive rotation at the tibiofemoral joint requires a different approach in evaluation and treatment of the knee than we usually do. So the take home message today for you is that to treat a patient successfully, first of all, as we all know, we are good diagnosticians. So we should diagnose the source of the painful tissue, treat the source and not so much the painful tissue. Uh, it is important to find out the source and treat this. The moment we treat the source to the, uh, the pain reduces in the painful tissue. 
and it's extremely important to integrate exercise with correct alignment in all functional activities as we did with alka and also extremely important to pay attention in uh, actually we uh, sleep for around 8 hours we probably sit for at least 8 hours that's 2/3 of a day for years and no years we are in wrong sustained positions and that should be corrected if we have a patient with pain i am highly indebted to all my teachers in so many years of my practice and learning but especially for this presentation shirley salmon mark pomerford sara motram christopher powers jenny mcconnell who whom i have had the great fortune to be trained with and who has given me new eyes to see the musculoskeletal problems in a very different way thank you so much